So hello everybody. Thank you for being on tonight. I, my name is Noelle Schroeder. I think I know everybody on the call, but in case you don't know me, I'm a sales coordinator with the Juice Plus company. And I have been in the Juice Plus business and taking the Juice Plus products for almost three years now. And before that, uh, I was an energy healer and a yoga teacher, and I still do a little bit of energy healing today. I call it intuitive coaching because it's all on the phone. I was trained by a teacher back in, starting in back in 2006 to read clairvoyantly people's energy fields and mainly the chakra system. Uh, there are actually several chakra systems, but I'm going to focus on the one that pertains to your emotions and your belief systems and um, the ability we have to carry other people's energy in our field. So it's the astral chakra system. And the reason I started studying that work was twofold. As I was teaching yoga, I was getting more and more interested in the deeper work um, of the mind and mindfulness in the energy field and sort of beyond the physical practice. And so I studied Reiki before finding this teacher and I became a Reiki master. And what was happening to me was I was teaching yoga full time uh, privately as well as in group classes, you know, all day, four to five days a week. And I was starting to add Reiki into my practice with my private clients. And I was completely exhausted, depleted, and burned out. And it felt like I had just started my career and I was already not sure how I was going to continue. And by divine providence, I believe, um, I had been asking for help and asking for a teacher. And I found one and she started teaching me what, or, or, and helping me become aware of what I didn't know, which was that, I, that I'm an empath. And my definition of empath is that you are very sensitive to all of the energy around you, um, that you pick up on everything. You have an easy time absorbing what is around you from other people, from whatever is just kind of floating in the ethers. And a lot of that gets dumped into the ether by people. So um, I was always, even as a little kid, um, having strange physical symptoms that couldn't really understand or explain. And then they would go away very quickly and um, just physicalizing a lot of other people's emotions. Now, looking back, I can say that's what I was doing. But at the time, I didn't understand it. My parents didn't understand it. So it all started to make sense when she started explaining this to me and started teaching me in depth about the chakra system and how, um, according to the, the work that she had studied, how, how it worked and how I could manage my energy field better so that I had healthier boundaries with everybody around me um, and basically healthy boundaries with the entire universe. Cause it, she, at the time she said, you know, basically all your circuits are blown and you look like you're carrying the energy of the entire universe in your little body. So <laughs> you're not supposed to be able to do that. So you have to stop. And I, you know, I didn't know how. So she started teaching me how, which was a godsend. It was life changing and transformative. So this is something I still practice today. I'm still uncovering the layers of what it means to be an empath and to take on other people's energy and, and sort of the psychological components of that. And I don't think I'm alone in this. Um, I may have a tendency more than most people to do this, but I believe that as a culture and in, in our society, we are trained to do this to some degree where it's a re it's reinforced that we go into empathy and we feel other people's pain and then we take responsibility for that pain and um re responsibility for trying to solve other people's problems so i believe what i was doing from the time i was little was i was not necessarily in my head solving people's problems but i was pulling their energy into my field if it felt painful to try and ease their pain. Does that make sense? So I was bringing it into my space to make the peace in the room, so to speak, um, uh, bring any conflict or tension down and make everybody feel better. Um, 
And maybe it was just one person that I wanted to make feel better. So I would just kind of pull their energy into my field. And it's easy to look at this as being a victim where, um, you know, this is something that other people are doing to me and therefore I'm a martyr and, you know, I'm supposed to live with it, live, live like this. But that's really, and that it's everybody else's fault. But it was really empowering for me to realize that I was making a choice. It wasn't conscious necessarily, but there was a choice that I was making to take on other people's stuff and that I could raise my consciousness around that and stop doing that and start to say no and manage my energy feel differently so that I was now telling on a psychic level, telling the universe um, you know, the shop is closed. I don't do that anymore. I'm not in that business anymore. What happens when you take on somebody else's energy and you start to take responsibility for it and you try to fix their problem, um, is that first of all, it depletes you because now that heavy energy that doesn't belong to you is in your field, but it also gets in the way of the other person's process and journey of evolving. So we might think we're making things better when in fact we're actually making things worse. We're making it worse for ourselves, but we're also making it worse for the other person because they don't get the opportunity to evolve around that problem that they're having. And you might say, but it's painful to watch that person continue to have that problem over and over and over again and continue to repeat that pattern again and again and again. And you're right, it is. And so lots of times we just don't want to watch that anymore. So we jump in and we try to fix it. But it's really up to them to decide what they're going to do or not do. And it's not our job to go in and fix it. So I'm going to show you a photo um, of the energy field. And I just found this online. I was just doing a little searching um, because my teacher actually didn't have the best visual or it wasn't very big for me to really show you on the screen. So I'm going to share the screen and just put this up for you. Can you all see that? Um, I can't see you. So if somebody could just unmute for a second and say, yes, that'd be good. <laughs> yes, we can see it. Okay. Thank you. So, this, the areas of the field I'm going to focus on uh, are the second chakra, which is right here. Sometimes it's called the navel chakra. And there are a thousand and one interpretations of the chakra system. And I'm not going to claim that the one that I was trained in is the right one. I'm just going to teach from the one that I was trained in. And that one says that the second chakra is about two finger widths below the navel. And then What's not shown in this picture is something called the compassion center, which lies right here between the heart chakra and the throat chakra. So right at the top of the collarbone, if you can see where I'm moving my cursor, it's the place where you tend to put your hand when you hear a heartwarming story. And, and it's actually your compassion center. So it's, and sometimes it's called the higher heart. So the tendency here is to be in the second chakra. And the second chakra has a lot of functions, um, but one of the functions that it has is empathy. And if you ever studied child development, at between ages five and seven is when kids develop empathy and they start to learn what it feels like to be other human beings from other human beings' perspectives, right? So they, they start to feel out what it feels like to be in somebody else's shoes. So they do open the second chakra. So your chakras are these, I should explain the chakras. The chakras are wheels of light or spheres of light. And they open. Um, they open out in front of you and they open behind you. And the so between ages five and seven is when you start to learn to open the second chakra in order to feel other people's feelings. It's almost like it acts like an antenna for you to pick up on, any, on, on other people's feelings and energy in order to understand what it means um, to have these different perspectives as a human being. And it's a really important part of our development and evolving. But at some point, 
we have to learn to close the second chakra. And I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna, I have a visual here to show you what that might look like. And <laughs> it's a vegetable steamer. <laughs> So imagine that the chakra can open and close like this in front and in the back of you, okay? And we tend to think that the chakras just kind of do this on their own. They do in a way because we're not necessarily consciously paying attention to them. But if we bring our consciousness to realizing that we are in charge of our, of our energy system and so we can boss our chakras around and tell them what to do, this is a wide open second chakra where you're feeling and picking up on everybody's energy. And this is a, a second chakra that's set at about, we'll call it 25%. So the vegetable steamer is just about closed. And this is a really powerful tool for closing the empathy center because as adults, we have lived enough life to not necessarily have to keep going into empathy and feeling everybody's pain in order to understand what human pain is all about, right? We've all had a lot of different kinds of challenges and struggles, and they're not going to be exactly like everybody else's, but we kind of get the human condition at certain points during adulthood. And so this is less and less. We might we might want to do it for a second, but then we can't really hang out there because then it's debilitating to us and it's not helpful to them. Because once this is open, we're taking it all in and we're taking it away from them and not allowing them to do, to do their process. And, and now we walk away feeling about 20 pounds heavier than we did a minute ago. And we're wondering why we're exhausted. So so this is something that you can train your second chakra to do, and we're going to practice it in a few minutes, but I just want to show you the visual. So if you put your hand on your compassion center, this is the place where you understand the human condition, but you don't have to take it on as yours, whatever this other person's struggle is. You can simply observe and support with compassion. Um, the, the upper chakras, if you think about the upper chakras as sort of part of your evolutionary path, you're evolving and utilizing the upper chakras more and more as you move up in vibration, as you raise your consciousness level. So you really want to be spending more and more of your time as you evolve from the heart chakra, which is in the center of the chest up. And so if you hang out in your compassion center, the compassion center is an energy center, but not exactly a chakra. It, it's, if it's wide open, it's okay because it's not just going to pull in a bunch of energy that doesn't belong to you. So you, you, there's a visual I'll walk you through where you can feel like you're turning it on and you're simply in compassion. And really what you're doing is listening. Most people, when they're struggling with something, they just want to be heard. They just want to be listened to. They don't necessarily want you to solve their problems. They might in the moment because they feel so desperate, but really if, they, if you were to ask them, they would say, no, I really do want to figure this out. I really do want to solve this. So by being in compassion, you're not uh, depleting your own energy field and you're not getting in the way of their process. So someone, a, a quintessential example of somebody who's always in his compassion center is the Dalai Lama. And regardless of religion, just if you can picture his face and whenever you see a photo of him, he's always glowing and he's always smiling and he's never, um, you know, looking depleted. I mean, I think he, he seems to be ageless. I don't know how old he is, but he just seems to go on and on and on and have this endless amount of energy. And he's traveling the world and he's witnessing all kinds of you know, horrible things. And he, he's, he's, he meditates a lot. That's part of it, but he's always in compassion. That's his practice. So it's, it's where you can rise above and not be in the trenches with somebody and observe, you know, in a way that is supportive and loving without taking responsibility. So 
let's just practice that a little bit because I think it's worth sort of trying to feel or see in your own body. And for some people, you know, some people are very visual, other people are very tactile, um, other people learn in a more auditory way. So you may not feel anything, you may not see anything, but, but if you kind of just keep playing with these tools and fake it till you make it, eventually it will probably start to make sense to you. I remember when my when I first started learning these tools, I said to my teacher, you know, I don't know if this is working. And she goes, well, do you feel better? And I'm like, yeah. She goes, well, I think it's working. <laughs> so, so you just kind of have to trust that even if you're not seeing or feeling anything, it's probably working. So just close your eyes for a minute and take a couple of deep breaths. And the first thing I want you to do is put your hand on your second chakra, at, you know, just below your navel and just Take, take some deep breaths and just feel what your second chakra feels like. What, is, what does it feel like? Just bring your awareness there. Imagine you're a, a mini me, you know, and you can travel into these different places in your body. What does it feel like to be in your second chakra? And you don't have to answer that. This is just a question you can answer in your own mind. And is there a sense of um, it being really open? Can you tell if it's really open? Can you tell if it's somewhat closed or somewhere in the middle? Are there any emotions that you feel when you're there? Any thoughts that show up? And now picture that vegetable steamer closed or, or almost all the way closed. So we call that 25% open. And you, if, if it's not easy to picture it, you can tell your second chakra, you want it to go to 25%. You, you really, however it works for you, you're just setting the intention of your second chakra at 25%. And then let it open really wide. And then close it up again. And then open it again. And just do that one or two more times. Just notice if there's a difference between the two and what that might be. And you know, you can jot down your answers if you want to kind of take note of them or just, just take note in your own mind. And now move your hand up to the top of your collarbone. So your, your fingertips can kind of sit on the bone itself and the palm of your hand kind of sits right above your heart chakra. And I believe that that's where your thymus gland is. And continue to take a, some deep breaths and just notice what it feels like there. And then imagine this stream of light, light pink energy, like a rose quartz colored energy. 
streaming in from the horizon and filling up your, set, your compassion center. That light pink is compassion energy. And then imagine a figure eight of gold connecting your compassion center to your heart chakra just below it in the center of your chest. And again, just notice, you know, whatever might come up for you, emotions, thoughts, physical sensations, you can jot them down if you want. And it, this is, this, you know, can get very personal. So I, I don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable, but if there's anybody that would like to share what they experienced or has a question about something they, they experienced, feel free to speak up. So one of the things that happens with this second chakra pattern or one of the things that is um, related to it is codependence. And if you as a child were parentified in any way, um, it didn't have to be alcoholism, which would be the classic codependent relationship, but it could have been anything where you became, for some reason, the peacemaker. You became the one that held the energy for everyone, kept everything calm and peaceful. Um, you became the one that sort of took responsibility for getting things done and sort of being the adult. This is classic second chakra stuff. And so you may have had the tendency because of cultural reinforcement, and then you got reinforcement at home for doing this as well. And if you think about our culture, we do have the tendency to get confused between empathy and compassion and we get a reinforcement for stepping in and helping when sometimes stepping in and helping isn't over helping. It's a crossing of a boundary that isn't necessarily helpful. It, you know, and, it, and there's a lot of gray area. I'm not saying I'm going to, you know, I think every situation is different, but I think what you can, what you can do when you come into a situation like this is kind of bring, like if you have a moment to close your eyes and bring your awareness, to, okay, where am I? And what, how does this feel in my body? And, and if it feels really yucky or if it feels really good and, you know, and then after the fact, how does it feel? You know, because it might feel really good in the moment to be, in your second chakra sort of over helping because that's what you identify with. That's what feeds your sense of self-worth is to, to be in there kind of in the trenches doing that thing. But then you might be exhausted, you know, an hour later or the next day. So just pay attention over time to what it feels like to be in your compassion center instead. And in that help, you, you can still help, but how much do you help? And, and, and more importantly, are you taking in the energy of that situation? Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about tonight in a nutshell. It's a, you know, it's an abbreviated version of like a really, for me, a lifelong lesson that I'm still, like I said, that I still work on and practice and play with every day. But I think it's, it's a valuable one, not only for our personal relationships, but for our business, because it's real easy. If this is a pattern for you, you're going to take it everywhere you go, right? So I'm still learning, even though I've slowed way down in my energy healing practice and I don't teach yoga anymore, any job I do, any business I do, I'm going to take that tendency to be empathic with me. So I have to really watch myself um, to not take responsibility for my team, to not want to 
you know, to, to not step in where I feel like I want to step in and make something easier for somebody. And, and sometimes that's really appropriate. And sometimes I got to back off and let them figure it out and sort it out and work it out in their own time, in their own way, on their own journey. So it's, it's that boundary, right? How much, how much do you step in and how much do you allow them to do their thing? And, uh, and so I think it's a valuable tool to, to, to have in your toolkit when you're building a team, when you're working with team, uh, you know, whether it's sideline, upline, or downline, um, how much are you taking on that really isn't yours to take? And I think when you're working from your compassion center, you're always going to be in a, in a healthier place of um, being supportive, being supportive, being a facilitator, being a great coach, but stepping back and allowing people to do their journey in the way that they need to do it. And then um, you're going to feel, you know, strong and, and self-sufficient and able to do, have the energy to do your business and they're going to feel the same way. Um, and really the word is empowerment, right? That everybody has this feeling of empowerment that nobody has to sort of do each other's work, whether it's personal or professional, there's this sense of like, we're working together, but we're, we're giving each other space to also do our personal work. So are there any questions or comments or anything? I just wanted to mention it's such a good reminder because I do this and I know you've taught me this and I still forget and I don't do the tools. But the big thing I learned in the beginning of the business in terms of business was with customers that were coming to me with all their problems and thought Juice Plus would solve it, but they actually didn't want to be helped. They just had all emotional stuff. And then, oh, Juice Plus isn't working. They just wanted to keep perpetuating their issues and not really get help. And then I was, I was, that's where I classic example with customers was taking in all their stuff. And I was help trying to help them in all these ways as therapists. As a, and I was like, wait a minute, this is like not what I signed on for. And I would help, try to help a friend anyway with that stuff, but it became so over the top. And then they quit juice plus and it was like, I just spent all this time and it wasn't like I wasted. I mean, I learned and I did help her through some things, but I kind of realized that some people don't actually want all the help that they think they're, you know, they think they're looking for, but they just want attention or they just, they don't really want the health journey. And I have to let those people go pretty early on and not push because um, I was feeding her its need for attention and taking in all her other problems. Yeah. So that is not helpful in our business to me. All my energy went to her and it was not worth, it was not worth it in the end. Well, and it's not sustainable, right? The way I was burnt out teaching yoga and doing energy work and the way that I was doing it, it was not sustainable. Yeah. So I've been able to teach in a way that, and I got better, you know, as I went along and I got, you know, using these tools, it, it got easier and easier to go in and teach and, and have that um, stamina throughout the day to keep going. But if you are taking care of every customer to that length, to that degree, it's, it's not sustainable for you and it's not helpful for them. Yeah. If they're not really committed to that, this journey, and I realized she wasn't after a few months, it was just about just pouring out all her needs and every message and email. And then it wasn't, in the end, she wasn't really committed to her health journey and it's just, right. yeah. So I, I had to let it go, you know, I had to let it go and she quit on it and that was fine because I, I knew it wasn't going to last. I could tell. Yep. So. Yep. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Yeah. It stood out really. That was a big, that was yeah. in the beginning and I don't do that anymore with, with, with customers. You know, I can tell early on if they're, you know, if this is what they're really ready for. If they're not ready, I, I can't push them along. You know, can't. Well, and when I first started um, and Cynthia Gompers said, something on a training that, you know, the light bulb went on for me when I first started with Juice Plus, because I was, I was wanting to help all the sick people. And once yeah. again, I was in that pattern, right? And Cynthia, That's what said, I was doing. Yeah. Cynthia said in a training, don't look for the sick people. Um, look for the healthy, when you're in a crowded room, look for the, the fit people, the healthy people, because those are the people that are actually on a health journey. Yeah. Um, the sick people may be wanting to get on a health journey. So, you know, sometimes they're totally ready to go with you. 
but sometimes they're attached to being sick and they're not really ready to get on a health journey. So you have to, you know, sort of, again, if you're here, you're going to know that more quickly than if you're stuck in your second chakra, you know, sort of empathizing and taking it all in. Yeah. I'm seeing it even in follow-ups that I do after a few follow-ups when they clearly have, they're like shouting their needs, but they don't follow through. I'm like, that's, I, then I know when I need to close the door, they'll come find me if they really want it, but I, I can't, you know, I don't, I don't want that situation again. So. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's so true. I think the key thing here is this is their journey. We can coach them, we can help them to a certain extent, but if they don't want to help themselves, there is only that much we can do. I learned that in my coaching business, like you can help the client, you can empower them, you can encourage them, but you cannot really replace their goals with your goals and you cannot replace their personality with your personality. That's right. No matter how hard you try, you help, yeah. you coach, but if they just want to keep complaining and staying where they are, you cannot fix them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not going to work anyway. So, yeah. You need and to know where to stop, how far you can go. That's right. And I think um, for a lot of us that have had, had any kind of training in this area, it, a lot of it is intellectual or we may have read some books on this. And so it's, it, we, we, we know the language around it. We know the verbiage, but we don't necessarily know how to shut it off. And so by connecting with with where the places are literally in your body that you're doing this, it might help you, especially if you're, you know, physically oriented in that way to connect to, okay, am I in my second chakra right now? Or am I in my compassion center? I needed that because for me to only understand it intellectually wasn't going to help me stop. I needed to understand, you know, what can I do and, and what does that feel like? in my body. So just, you know, to have the tactile tool sometimes is, it brings it into a more concrete state for, for people. Yeah, this is true. Knowing is one thing and feeling is a completely different. You may know three times and still keep doing it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hmm. Poster child. That's my, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is so, Noel, sometimes you feel like in a big place of lots of people. Sometimes you feel like drained. Uh -huh. yeah. so. that's, that's your second chakra, Natalia. That's perfect example. Yeah. So Yeah, I get overwhelmed with that. Yeah. So that's your signal. Um, before you walk into that crowded space, close your second chakra. You know, let your mini me walk up to your compassion center and hang out here in that crowded space. It's a completely different experience. If, if any of you are familiar with Washington Street, Downtown Crossing in Boston, that's essentially the neighborhood I used to teach in. And if I walked down that street, I was a mess because the, the energy was so chaotic in there and there were a lot of homeless people that I would completely you know, empathize with. I could just feel everybody's energy. And as soon as I learned these skills and put them into practice, I loved walking down Washington Street. I thought it was fun. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a light and amusing experience instead of heavy. So that, those are clues that that's your second chakra being wide open and taking it all in. Noelle, I had a question on that. You just triggered a, a thought. <clears throat> when I go to Cabela's where they have all the animal taxidermy animal, animals, on the front side, I'm fine, where it's all little critters and deer. My father was a deer hunter. Yeah. I'm part Indian. I feel like those are okay. Mm -hmm. But when I go around to the other side and it's the bigger animals, it's like the life just get the air just gets sucked right out of me. Mm -hmm. And it's been like that ever since they opened that store. Isn't that fascinating? So you're empathizing with those animals. And again, it's not that empathy is a bad thing, but if you can't function <laughs> through that empathizing experience, then you gotta, you gotta shut it down at some point and say, okay, I know what that feels like now. I'm gonna stay in my compassion center because I can't fix this. I, there's nothing I can do about this situation. So I gotta let go and just be in compassion and, and try to come to terms with, you know, 
maybe there's a larger purpose, you know, maybe those animals are, on a, are in a better place. I don't know, whatever your belief system is around that, to come to, you know, a higher um, perspective. And so by just getting out of your second chakra, you're going you're gonna to just lift your vibration and see, a, see it differently, see, see a bigger view that will, will hopefully be comforting to you. So being in the second chakra or any of the others is not necessarily, it's not first a conscious thing. It is just a thing that happens when some, the situation you're in triggers that one, right? Right. Um, and it's so not if that I there's... Walk, if I walk through with my hand here. Yeah, do that. probably a completely different do that before you even walk into the store imagine the vegetable steamer in your second chakra closed put your hand here stream that pink light in and just walk through you know being here instead and see how that feels now in the beginning you know your second chakra may be so used to being open that it doesn't really want to close it's like exercising a muscle you it takes practice and you you just have to get bossy with it and you know, remember that you're in charge, not your chakras. So, okay, I'm closing you down so I can hang out in this higher perspective while I walk through the store. And, you know, over time that should get better and easier and lighter. I've actually seen people walking like that. <laughs> I don't know what they were doing. I just thought they were being like, well, they don't, they, they probably don't know what they're doing either. It's an, you know, it's an instinct that they're not even conscious of. Well, I think I, what I'm realizing, the times I've done that, I'm thinking, oh, I was, I was being sympathetic, but I, I knew I had to have a line. I don't think I consciously realized that that's what I was. Yeah. But yeah. I remember being like that, thinking I wasn't pretending to be sympathetic. I was being sympathetic, but I was like, okay, I need a boundary here with this, but I'm going to be, you know, sympathetic. Yeah.